Dr. Hall studied zoology at Pomona College in California and biology at UNC Chapel Hill, where he earned his PhD with research on box turtles. He worked for 24 years with the NC Natural Heritage Program as an invertebrate zoologist and landscape ecologist. He also worked um, with the NC Division of Parks and Recreation in, in his earlier years and is back um, collaborating with them, uh, working on the NC Biodiversity Project. In, and he's gonna talk about that more in his program. In, uh, 20, in 2016, he was awarded the Thomas L. K. Wildlife Diversity Award from the NC Wildlife Resources Commission as a leader in wildlife resources conservation and for outstanding contrib contributions to wildlife diversity in North Carolina. So it's a, a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Hall to share his program on valuing insects. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking you for inviting me to, uh, to give this presentation. Uh, I think this is the very first time I've ever spoken about insects to a group of um, people primarily concerned with plants. Uh, but in, in my uh, uh, career as a conservation biologist, I found it's always a really good idea to share information across taxonomic groups. Uh, all too often, uh, conservation biologists are too concentrated on conserving their own particular taxonomic group, and they really don't understand the connections that they need to be aware of uh, involving other species. And so this, this uh, talk I'll be giving tonight uh, is the uh, value that we need to place on insects and that includes their role as herbivores, as species that, that feed primarily on plants, as well as a lot of other interactions they have with their, um, with their environment, their ecosystems. And it's, it's really by getting this bigger picture of how organisms interact with one another that I think conservation can be at its most effective. And it really has to be multidisciplinary. So the topic is valuing ins insects. And that um, means to me um, more than just developing a liking for insects. You don't have to like them uh, to appreciate their value in the, in the ecosystem, the value they have for us, uh, that it's in our own vested interest to pay more attention to them. Um, but there are in fact, a lot of uh, very attractive insects that sort of help that process. Um, there are a lot of insects that have really bright colors, um, very interesting patterns. Uh, there's some insects that, that um, sing very pleasant songs. The tree crickets are among the, uh, the prettiest singers of our native um, orthopterans. Uh, but the value uh, of insects goes far beyond just the, the pretty ones and the, 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 the pleasant ones, the ones we, we sort of like to have around. It also includes insects that we may know nothing about. Some of them play pretty important roles. Um, this face, I think, uh, would be hard for anybody to find terribly attractive. Um, it's interesting nonetheless, because you're, when you're looking at this insect, you're actually looking back in time about four and a half um, hundred million years, uh, years ago. These were some of the first insects to show up on earth. And uh, they still, this particular group, the bristletail still per, looks pretty much the way they did 450 million years ago, pretty long time. And there are some insects that, that are, are rightfully ones that we need to be wary about, that can sting or otherwise harm us. Um, but even them have um, values that go beyond uh, just having to be wary of them. They, they actually are, are quite important in the environment. And uh, there are some insects that we probably um, are gonna have a hard time ever finding any value for, but. Uh, and I can't say much about the cockroaches because they're introduced species and uh, <laughs> the main, main role they play is, is um, infesting our homes. But the green bottle fly does play a very important role in decomposition. And even mosquitoes are some good things you can say about mosquitoes. This is the biggest of our mosquito species, the elephant mosquito. And they actually do not feed on uh, blood. The females do not need blood for uh, for, um, to, in order to create their egg masses. And um, the, uh, they actually have a value uh, that we can appreciate. The, the larvae of these mosquitoes are major predators on other mosquito larvae. In tree holes in particular, um, the larvae of elephant mosquitoes are, are some of the major predators on other mosquitoes that do in fact um, prey on people. <clears throat> 
Okay, if you go back to the 1950s, the uh, situation regarding insects, the way people thought about insects was pretty black or white. Uh, it was generally us versus them. Uh, there was even a movie <laughs> labeled them, um, which I'm sure looking at some of your faces, uh, some of you probably saw back during that time period. And at that time, we also um, had a, a big campaign uh, uh, to uh, endorsing massive aerial spraying of insecticides across the environment. Um, this, <laughs> this one looks pretty dated, but uh, it, it was uh, this, this and uh, commercials for insecticides were very prominent back in the 1950s. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this sort of thing. Uh, when I look at this picture, I, I can see myself in that little group of people. I was that I was about that age when I first saw my first um, DDT spraying truck passing through my neighborhood, killing off all the mosquitoes, presumably. Um, but this was the period right after World War II when we developed these, these huge World War fighting tactics. And following the end of the, uh, the war with other humans, uh, we had all this equipment and capability for attacking our, our probably our oldest, one of our oldest groups of enemies, the insects. And we went about it in a very big, uh, me very mechanized war sort of fashion, spraying the whole uh, earth with uh, toxic chemicals. Didn't matter if the insects we were killing were harmful or not. Uh, we, we hope we were killing the harmful ones, but uh, if there were a lot of benign insects or even um, beneficial insects that were killed, well, who cared? <laughs> not much. Um, and we had, uh, massive aerial spraying campaigns where these pesticides, DDT in particular, were, were just sprayed massively over the landscape. Didn't matter who was down there below, um, everything was, was fair game for the eradication of our most serious enemies, the, the insects. By the 1960s though, there was evidence that this massive uh, campaign to kill all insect life on earth was, was not working the way it was supposed to. For one thing, some of the insects that we were trying to kill um, became adapted to the, the pesticides. We no longer worked on them. And we were also finding that the, the insecticides were killing a lot of species that we really did not want, that we did not intend to die, although we had not given much thought to it. Um, birds would drop out of, the, out of the skies following these spraying events. And eventually there was a connection made between the loss of reproductive capability among a lot of bird species and they're eating insects that have been poisoned with DDT. Uh, species like brown pelicans out in California, bald eagles, um, various other hawks and uh, particularly insect eating birds were all showing reproductive failures that were eventually traced to DDT. Um, it was Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring, that brought all this to the attention of the nation, not just her book, but also her testimony in front of Congress. And this was the beginning, the true beginning of, of the modern conservation movement, where we, we were all much more aware of the un, uh, unintended consequences of, of all-out war waged on insects. Uh, this, was, <laughs> this was not um, a well-thought-out uh, enterprise, and, and it was so huge that it was just having enormous consequences on the entire planet. Okay, so th things are different now, um, largely thanks to Rachel Carson and the, the environmental movement that have, has emerged um, beginning in the 70s and, and has uh, uh, kept on growing since that time. But you can still find uh, evidence of um, hostility towards insects. Um, I was attending a, a bug fest several years ago, a, 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 one of the, uh, a presentation that, that you would normally think was, was trying to promote the interests of insects, but I was sitting next to a man uh, who had a very nice display of carnivorous plants in a terrarium. And um, very nice specimens, beautifully kept, um, but they had no, no sign of any insect feeding damage on them. So I asked him if he knew anything about the insects that um, feed only on um, pitcher plants, 
and if he knew anything about their their the, the range of adaptations they had for 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 uh, for feeding us such a dangerous host plant, and he he exclaimed, "Why, why those are pest species?" <laughs> That's about as far as the conversation went. Um, in other words, he was putting them in the bad bug category, even though these are species that that are, you know, out only in native ecosystems, feeding on a native plant. The insects have been around feeding on those plants for thousands of years, but nonetheless, because they feed on a plant and because that plant has some appeal to humans, that automatically put it in the bad, bad bug category. Um, so it's, it, those, those attitudes are, are, are st still there. And uh, that's one of the things I'd like to, to address tonight, just how we can change our, our attitude towards uh, presuming every insect is a bad bug until proven otherwise. Okay, here are two shots, uh, just sort of a little test case. Um, which of these uh, is a more appealing picture? Uh, I think toward, to a native plant gardener, the, uh, the beautiful, perfect specimens on the left-hand side would be the most appealing and the, the, the heavily bug infested uh, pitcher plants on the right hand uh, shot would be not something you'd want to have in your garden. But if you're looking at the ecosystems that these species belong to, uh, the one on the right is the healthy ecosystem. The one on the right uh, left is the un very unhealthy ecosystem and, and probably is not likely to uh, long for this world. Um, the presence of insects uh, in a healthy ecosystem is, is a very good sign. It means the system is still intact. It's got all its uh, species uh, oh, present. And, um, and uh, the ecological processes that maintain pitcher plant bogs in general are working as they should. The one on the right, uh, sorry, the left-hand shot is taken from a, a very small remnant patch of pitcher plants that's now highly isolated and um, probably on its way out. It's lost its insects and the plants are very likely to follow uh, in the footsteps of those, those insects. Um, I did a survey of pitcher plant bogs in the Uaris about 10 years ago, looking for both plants and insects. And I found a lot of plant, uh, pitcher plant bogs formerly in very good shape that looked like this. These plants are starving and they're not being damaged by insects. The insects have long departed the scene. They can't make a living on plants that look like these. Instead, the real villain here is the, the loss of fire in the habitats. These, these plants have now become overshaded by trees and um, they're virtually being starved, starved death from lack of, uh, of sunlight. And that's happening all through the URIs. There were very, I found only, we only found one population left that still had any insects in it. All the rest were, were tiny little populations. Um, uh, and um, <laughs> a lot of them unfortunately look like this. Okay, I'd like to talk about the history of, of sort of life on earth, uh, on, on dry land that is, uh, terrestrial uh, habitats. Uh, insects and plants have been um, coexisting for literally hundreds of millions of years. The first insects um, showed up uh, right after the first um, plants e evolved to, to live on dry land. The first land plants were followed fairly quickly by, by uh, insects and a few other arthropods like millipedes and scorpions also showed up about the same time on land. But it was the insects that became the dominant herbivores, the species that most closely interacted with plants. And that's been true for this, this whole past 250, uh, four, sorry, almost 500, 500 million years of, uh, of evolution on dry land, insects and plants have been uh, having to co-adapt to one another, coexist with one another. And together they form the fabric of almost all, virtually, no, they, they form the fabric of all terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, vertebrates showed up much later, the ones we identify, the first amphibians show up about 100 million years later. Uh, dinosaurs and mammals still hundreds of millions of years later. And then we show up just almost yesterday in the, uh, the landscape. Um, between the time insects first evolved and the time that humans sort of have taken over the planet, 
insects were the dominant um, group of animals on the planet, much more important ecologically than, than the dinosaurs or the mammals or the birds. Um, they are the base of, the, of most food webs. They are doing most of the herbivory, turning plant material into forms that, that uh, other animals can use. Uh, they have been involved in, in all the key uh, ecological processes that keep ecosystems functioning, much more so than any other group of uh, animal. It's only when humans arrived and started actually just creating new habitats that suited them, their own needs that, um, that the earth has been taken over by another much more dominant species. Okay, so this is, um, the first insects were very, um, they were actually evolved from crustaceans. They had a, a few traits that allowed them to, to live on land, but they, uh, the earliest insects were, con were confined to feeding on, on algae and um, uh, mosses, liverworts, and, and detritus. They weren't, um, their jaws were just too weak to really handle um, anything tougher than, than algae. And these insects are still with us. The, the bristletails are still around. They're on all the different continents, but they never radiated into as many forms as modern insects. They, 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 they maintained their, their very primitive lifestyle all this time. Um, so they are very successful in that. They've, done, they've survived through at least five major extinction events. And, okay, so here's what, a, a, what the most primitive insects look like. Um, modern insects evolved fa fairly quickly after insects themselves uh, arose on the scene. Uh, one of the first major advance advancements in their um, biology was the development of much more powerful jaws. Uh, you can see this in this nice pinch bug, uh, some very nice mandibles they have. And this has allowed them to, to tackle almost any uh, edible item uh, on the planet. They can now feed on just almost anything. Um, their mouth parts are not only very powerful, but they can also be modified uh, evolutionarily into all kinds of different forms that are adapted to feeding on different uh, types of uh, items. But even more important is the evolution of wings. Insects were the first to develop the power of flight of any organism on earth that is powered flight where they could actually go from place to place where, and go to places where they wanted to go. Uh, some spiders can balloon and other, thing, other organisms can send up seeds into the atmosphere and they sort of float around, but insects were the first ones to develop a uh, directed flight, a powered flight. And this gave them a huge advantage in terms of colonizing all different kinds of habitats on earth uh, that they, they very quickly can uh, if a new habitat opens up, um, they're able to colonize it very quickly because they're so, they are so mobile. And mobi mobility is, is generally one of the main features of, of insect adaptations to, to, um, to life on Earth. Gives them a huge advantage. Related to um, the development of wings is uh, the development, the, the evolution of a developmental process called metamorphosis. This is a split between uh, two different lifestyles. The, you have a, a larval form uh, that, that does, not, um, does not fly, does not uh, disperse very well. It's adapted to feeding uh, only. Um, and then you have an adult form that's uh, very mobile, capable of flight, capable of moving around, uh, finding mates, dispersing. And having these two different lifestyles has allowed them to, um, to take advantage of, of many different uh, environments that, that would be hard to combine into, um, if you just had one form, just one, like, like vertebrates have, just one adult form that does all the, the feeding and reproduce, re reproducing and so on. You can't have these specialized lifestyles the way that insects can with, the, with metamorphosis. Okay, metamorphosis itself shows how plastic the insect uh, body plan can be. You can switch from a, a, a larval form, looks like a caterpillar or a grub, to a, a winged uh, adult. Uh, the insect body is very um, malleable, and evolutionarily, you, you can get um, all kinds of very specialized body forms um, based on the, this, this basic, the fundamental insect body plan. Uh, you probably have all seen pictures of orchid manises, beautiful insects uh, in Southeast Asia that, that mimic um, very closely uh, some of the uh, pretty orchid flowers down in that region. 
we don't have any of those. I'd, I'd show you one, a picture of those if we had them. Uh, instead, I'm showing you an insect that's native to North Carolina. This is um, the northern grass mantis, and you can see it looks very much like the grasses in which it lives. It's a savanna species. And you find them primarily in the coastal plain uh, where they live in, in, in grasslands. Very highly modified for existence in that, uh, that habitat. Okay, the, the adaptations insects have goes beyond just morphology and um, flight and jaws and so on. They have uh, metabolic adaptations um, that allow them to feed on, on various, uh, various kinds of foods. I'm gonna talk about um, some of the ecological roles at the same time I'm talking about their adaptations, starting with uh, herbivory. This is uh, insects, how they've adapted to feeding on plants, something that they had to do from the very beginning and have been uh, very successful in doing, um, taking advantage of, of plants as food. Uh, this particular pair, this, uh, the monarch butterfly and its larva on the right, um, illustrate the, me the metabolic superpowers of, of insects. Uh, plants, as, as they are fed upon by insects, develop uh, poisonous compounds, alkaloids, secondary compounds of various types, that are intended to deter insects feeding on them, to actually poison the insects. Um, milkweeds are a great example. They have the latex sap that's by itself, um, uh, uh, very hard for most insects to cope with, uh, unless they're specialized like the monarchs are. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the sap is also full of, of toxins, poisons. Um, but as, in, as is true for many insects, uh, some insects have become adapted to actually not only coping with those poisons, but actually making use of them for their own purposes. The caterpillar on the right is very brightly colored. It's making no attempt to hide from, from birds or lizards or anything else. And the reason for that is that it's highly poisonous. It's a, it's a toxic species, a toxic uh, food item that most birds would, would spit out as soon as they, they, they try sampling it. And the reason for that that toxic toxicity is not something that it creates on its own, but instead it's, it's borrowing those alkaloids from the uh, milkweeds and is incorporating them into its own defense. And not only are the larvae able to use those alkaloids, but they can, uh, the adults when they metamorphose uh, still possess them and they make use of them as well. So the, the bright orange and red colors of the monarch um, are warning colors that they are not to be messed with. They're not to be eaten. And uh, if you've ever watched a monarch flying, they, they just sail along. They don't seem to have a care in the world. And, and one of the reasons for that is birds don't bother them. And the very fact that a monarch butterfly can travel thousands of miles from Canada to Mexico across vast areas of, of bird inhabited habitats um, is, a, is, a attri uh, is a, an example of just how effective those uh, protections are. It, you wouldn't have monarch migrations if they weren't a, a, a very toxic species for birds to, uh, to prey on. Okay, some insects have taken uh, a different route. Instead of becoming more and more specialized, they have become highly generalized. These are some of the three of the worst pest species on the planet. They're all native to North America, but they're now found pretty much around the, the globe. Um, these species are uh, polyphagous. That means their larvae can feed on many, many different kinds of plants. Um, they're able to handle, all, all plants pretty much produce alkaloids uh, to deter insect predators. But these guys have met, uh, metabolic um, means of, of coping with uh, all kinds of um, plant toxins, allowing them to eat just about any, any species of plant. Um, it's also something that's allowed them to survive pesticides. When these are some of the species that have been most heavily sprayed for uh, back during the campaigns to eradicate them of any species, and they were the ones that were very quickly able to adapt to those those um, toxins. An attribution to the power of their their metabolic um, adaptations for for dealing with uh, poisonous substances. They are also extremely mobile. Um, one of the, the main um, features of insect um, uh, adaptations. Uh, these guys are also migratory. They, they will fly up in the air uh, to fairly high elevations and they surf uh, weather fronts as they pass over the continent. 
and they can move hundreds uh, of miles in a single night. And so uh, they're able to spread easily when somebody plants a new crop somewhere. Um, it doesn't take them uh, take these insects too long to reach it, even from from hundreds of miles away. And as I said, they can feed on any species of plant, and they're particularly happy to find uh, the kinds of crops that humans um, plant because those 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 um, plants generally are very low in, in toxicity, otherwise we wouldn't be planting them. And so they just have a, a great time feeding on them. Um, so that's one group of insects that, that really um, are exporting insect adaptations to the hilt. And even if we don't like them, we can definitely call these bad bugs. Um, they are certainly worthy of our admiration for, for how they are able to cope with, uh, with various kinds of in, uh, in environments. Okay, going the other direction towards uh, sp specialization rather than general generalization, you have a lot of insects um, that are uh, herb herbivorous insects that are specialized specialists on only a, a very narrow range of plants. In some cases, just feeding on one species of plant. Uh, this is an example of a moth larva. If you don't rec, this is actually a caterpillar. Um, let's see, can I do that? Can you see my laser? Yeah, this is a, this is a caterpillar and it's developed, um, has evolved these tendril-like um, processes that make it look like the tendrils of its host plant. And I imagine most of you can recognize this plant as, as a Smilax. This species feeds only on, on Smilaxes. In North Carolina, uh, we have uh, a large number of species that are, that are uh, very specialized in terms of the host plants they, they use. We have 100 species that, 150 species that feed only on a single species of host plant. The, the moth in the, um, the slide is the nutmeg hickory underwing, and it gets that name because it only feeds, its larvae only feed on the nutmeg hickory. And I imagine that there aren't a whole lot of you that have ever seen nutmeg hickory um, in North Carolina. We have exactly one population uh, that we know of, and it's only, it only occupies about um, a square mile of habitat. Do you know what the scientific nearest... name is for that one? What's that? Do you know what the scientific name is? I think the group might like to know. Well, the, the moth is Catocla marissisiformis, and the hickory is um, Caria maristica, I believe. Thanks. And um, if you go for this, the next nearest population is in South Carolina. Again, there's just a very small population there. There's a population in, in Alabama. And it isn't until you get to the Ozarks that you really get big uh, populations of that particular species. But every one of those small populations <clears throat> that's been checked so far, <clears throat> excuse me, has a population of these, these highly specialized moths associated with it. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine how they survive in such small um, patches of habitat, but, but that's the only place where you can find this moth. It's the only place I've, I've seen them. I've seen them exactly once, the one time I was able to get access to the site. Uh, there are also a number of species that feed only on a single genus. There are quite a few species that feed on both um, bald cypress and pond cypress, and uh, that kind of pattern is, is fairly common. Um, I should say that these numbers are just um, counts that I made a few years ago. We actually have many more species that we can put in these categories now. Okay, pick a few, a few more examples here. Uh, we uh, you may know that, that uh, there are at least two vertebrates that specialize on bamboo, uh, the two pandas, the, the giant panda and the red panda. <clears throat> we have, uh, and that's, there are very few vertebrates that, that um, uh, herbivores that, that are that specialized. Um, we have no vertebrates that specialize in cane, on cane, our bamboo in uh, North America. But there are 20 species of moths and butterflies. There are also a number of, of leaf hoppers, uh, leaf mining flies, and other species that, that feed solely on cane uh, or in an area. Um, just to give you some idea of, of um, how insects compare to vertebrates in terms of herbivory. Insects are generally much more specialized than uh, any vertebrate um, uh, on, on the plants they feed on. Should say this one's very rare. It's only found up in our mountains. It's more of a Midwestern cane feeding thing in the Mississippi Valley, but we have one, one population way up in uh, 
um, uh, Madison County. Uh, I should give credit to Jim Petranka, um, a herpetologist friend of mine who, who discovered this population up there. Not only do you have a lot of species feeding on cane, but, you, but uh, they're concentrated within just a few genera of in insect um, groups. Uh, you have uh, two pearly eyes that feed on cane. They feed on the same patches of, of, um, of cane and how they divide up the, the habitat without competing with one another is, uh, is, is not entirely clear. But this is true for most of the species that feed on cane. They belong to genera that have uh, three or four species uh, in that particular genus that are specialists on, on cane. So they're doing more than just specializing on the plant. They're also dividing up the, the plant itself into different um, um, specialized feeding niches. Um, you have some, some insects that feed on the roots of cane, some on the stems that bore into the stems. Some feed on leaves, some roll the leaves up to make nests, but they, they all somehow manage to coexist uh, in, in North Carolina on, on a very you know, narrow range of host plants. Here are two of the skippers that feed on cane. Okay, uh, another really good example of, of uh, host plant specialists are, the pitcher, are in fact the pitcher plants that we started off with and some of the very earliest studies on the relationship between pitcher plants and their moth uh, symbionts was done here in North Carolina 100 years ago by Frank Morton Jones. If there are any pitcher plant aficionados among you, and I, I expect there are, you may know the name Jones from Saracenia Jones Eye, which is named after, in fact, Frank Morton Jones. Um, but he discovered there were, were quite close associations between certain insects and, and certain pitcher plants. This is the uh, um, Xyra fax, sorry, no, Xyra writings the eye that feeds solely on, on the yellow pitcher plant. And here is the larva of uh, Xyra um, writings the eye. Um, this, this is the same species I showed in the, in the initial photo um, earlier, uh, earlier in the presentation. They are extremely well adapted to feeding on these very dangerous plants. These are plants that, are, that are, um, have evolved to catch insects and consume them. But these moth, moth larvae are very, and the adult moths as well, are very well adapted to living inside these, these pitchers that are otherwise intended to, to send insects to their deaths. They, they actually screen off, uh, act, when the larvae hatch, they, the first thing they do is, is uh, to, to close off the entrances to the tubes so that wasps and spiders and other insects that might prey on the larvae themselves are kept out. And um, you can see this has got a little, little bit of a web across the, uh, the entrance. Um, they feed on the interior um, sides of the pitcher plants, as you can see do that again. This is all feeding damage, but you'll notice that they do not break through the surface of the plant. They're feeding only on the inner tissues. And the reason for that is they don't want to open up any holes that, that would let a, let a per, uh, predatory wasp in. Um, they do uh, drill holes in the very bottoms of the pitcher plants to drain them. Um, but otherwise, they, they're, they're doing their best to keep other insects out of the pitchers. The pitchers themselves are lined with um, downward pointing hairs, and they have very slick, waxy surfaces. So normally any insect that, that enters one of these pitchers, um, it's a one-way trip to the bottom and they can't, they can't escape because the sides are just too uh, impossibly slick to, uh, to manage. Um, but the pitcher plant, these, these caterpillars can go up and down these surfaces extremely easily uh, without showing any, any encumbrance by the, the slick surfaces or the, the downward pointing hairs. When it's time for them to pupate, they, they create a little hammock down in the bases of the pitcher plants. This is the pupa right here, the, the chrysalis, the pupa, sorry, pupa. They drill holes to make sure that the, uh, that the water doesn't fill up the bottoms of the, uh, the plant. Um, and then when they emerge, the adults um, of, the, of the pitcher plant moths um, are also they spend almost their entire lives inside these tubes. You very rarely find them outside. Uh, they do move outside so they can disperse between, um, between plants and between populations. 
but otherwise the adults spend their, all their time um, inside these, these shelters provided by the, uh, the pitcher plants. Okay, turning now to another group of, um, that, well, that's just to sum that up, they, they, these pitcher plant moths have obviously been evolving these adaptations to living in these pitcher plants for, for a very long time. Um, to just label them as a pest species just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't recognize the, the, uh, the length of time that these plants and animals have been adapted, adapting to one another. And um, the extreme nature of the specializations that are involved. The, uh, the pitcher plants are just some of the most spectacular examples of symbiosis that you can find anywhere in the state or even the country. And to, to label one of the symbionts as a pest species just, um, I still find that amazing. Okay, so let's turn to pollination. This is another form, this is actually another form of uh, herbivory. Uh, pollinators evolve from herbivores that are, that are specialized to feed on pollen, just, just one part of the plant, but it's still feeding on plants, so they're still herbivores, technically. Um, when you call something a pollinator, that doesn't automatically move it from the bad bug category to the good bug category. Um, some of them are, are pretty voracious pollen feeders, like the soldier beetle, and that may actually be, be disadvantaged, disadvantageous to the plants. But generally, um, they attract pollen, uh, the plants um, with their pollen um, are making use of insects for their own reproductive purposes. They, they um, are able to, the insects that feed on the pollen are able to, uh, some of the pollen attaches to their bodies and when they move from plant to plant, they move the pollen and, and in so doing um, fertilize the, the, the uh, recipient plants and by transferring the genes around through a population or between populations, they are making the plants themselves more robust to environmental disturbances. That's what sexual reproduction is all about, uh, being able to pr uh, produce enough variations, variants in your offspring, that if, if some disturbance comes along, you have enough uh, variations in your offspring that at least some of them are able, able to survive. So this is a very good thing to move pollen around um, and to do it effectively uh, is a, a great benefit to the plants. So um, these relationships um, have, have evolved into much more efficient means of, 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 of moving pollen. Um, both, both, species of, both the species of insects and the plants uh, benefit from uh, the evolution of a much more specialized, uh, of a much more specialized set of uh, relationships. And this is best, uh, probably best seen uh, in the evolution of bee species. These are wasps that were formerly all uh, predatory, but they started feeding on the pollen, making use of pollen to feed their, their young, to provision their young. Um, but over time, the, in, the insects and the plants have evolved together to make this, this relationship much more um, predictable and efficient and, and specialized. So the insects have developed these um, much more special, specialized structures. Bees have um, developed these pollen baskets for um, stuffing pollen into this. They want to take the pollen back to their nest to feed their young, but they're also in the process by moving from plant to plant, also distributing po pollen between uh, the plant individuals. You can also see that they have hairs in their bodies, which most wasps lack. Um, but the hairs on the bees are uh, able of, um, of, of capturing pollen and, uh, and, like I said, moving it between plants. So both the plant and the insect benefit, even though the, the, the insect is technically feeding on parts of the plant. Okay, um, so plants have developed flowers as a way of, of attracting insects to move their pollen. And um, in the process of e evolving a more efficient uh, system of, of uh, pollen transfer, they have developed uh, bright colors. They've developed these platforms for insects to land on called flowers. They've developed bright colors to attract the insects. They've developed fragrances to help uh, guide insects to feeding on certain plants. And they've also developed, uh, finally, an alternative food for the insects to make use of, that is uh, nectar. 
And um, this is a way of, of keeping the insects coming, uh, even though uh, they may no longer be feeding directly on the pollen, which the plant really has no interest in, in um, promoting. They don't really want their pollen to be eat it, eaten. So if they can provide an alternative substance for the insects to feed on, everybody's happy. Uh, one group of insects in particular has evolved almost entirely in a associ strong association with flowering plants, and that's the Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies. And their mouth parts um, have become highly adapted for, for taking advantage of the nectar that, that um, flowers produce. And uh, altogether, the, the bright, bright colors of insects, of, of moths and butterflies, they're very uh, day active uh, behaviors. They're, they're, they're complex uh, lifestyles that you can see, all the things that make them attractive to us. That's all thanks to the, the plants that, that sort of encourage the insects to become uh, daytime, visually oriented um, uh, species themselves. So uh, we have the evolution of nectar to thank for the very pretty um, swallowtail we see uh, right here. Uh, but it's, it's the association between plants and insects, it's their co-evolution that have brought about a lot of these, these adaptations that we otherwise might not give much uh, thought to. Where do insects get their bright colors and why do they have them? Uh, well, it, you have to be day flying and, and active and uh, you know, hunting out uh, colorful plants in order for that system to really work. Okay, I um, also want to give uh, attention to the, the big um, social colonies that bees are able to form by being able to use both pollen and nectar. They have a, a huge energy source in the form of nectar. They have food, food for their larvae in the form of pollination. And without uh, um, plants, uh, the big bee social structures would, would probably not exist. Uh, both our uh, European honeybees and our bumblebees are form big colonies that are fueled by a mixture of pollen and, and nectar. Okay, a lot of insects uh, also visit flowers for nectar that really are not terribly good at pollination. Uh, this is a, a paper wasp. Notice that unlike the bees, it has no hairs on its body, um, very shiny, smooth integument. Um, it may do some pollination um, by move, just simply by you know, picking up some pollen and carrying it to another uh, plant. But in this case, the plant is getting a different benefit from attracting this kind of species. Uh, it's sort of hiring its own um, set of mercenaries. Um, paper wasps are some of the most important predators of caterpillars. And so if you can attract um, predatory species uh, using your nectar, um, you're, you're getting the benefit of the protection they provide in, in, by them carrying off a, a lot of the caterpillars that otherwise would be feeding on. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of insects uh, in the food web. Um, this is uh, another really important ecological um, factor. Um, insects are, 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 are the most important herbivores. They're the uh, Lepidoptera alone have more species of herbivore than any other group of an, uh, animal um, on the planet, much more than any vertebrates, um, much more than, than other uh, groups of insects. Uh, it's, it's Lepidoptera that are turning leaf material into a form of um, matter that can be used by other uh, insects, in the case of uh, uh, insect predators like the, the swamp garner. But the things that feed on insects are also fed on themselves, fed on by other species like the Mississippi kite. If you ever go down to the Roanoke River and watch the Mississippi kites flying over the canopy, it's just amazing to watch them catch these big dragonflies in midair and feed on them while they're flying. They don't ever stop to feed. They just do it while they're sailing along. So insects are just hugely important as food for lots of different uh, other species of animals, uh, including uh, many of the, the, uh, the, the vertebrates that we, we treasure and, and, and finding in our, in our uh, woods and fields and so on. Uh, most of the songbirds that we have in, our, in North Carolina feed primarily on insects. Most of the, uh, the lizards, uh, a lot of the snakes, uh, shrews, bats, um, they're all feeding on insects and 
When insect populations decline, so do these species of, of vertebrates that feed on them. That's been shown in, in several cases now where um, massive die-off die-offs of insects have happened, usually have die-offs or declines in, in the vertebrate populations as well. Okay, so um, in terms of um, specializations for feeding on other insects, making use of other insects as prey, you have the same sort of very highly uh, adapted specialized systems among um, in insects and their pre uh, predators and insect predators and their prey that you see in, in the uh, herb herbivorous species feeding on very specialized uh, plants. Uh, this is one of the best examples that I know of. This is uh, the, the wasp on the left-hand side, the giant ichneumonid is a um, predator species on the species on the left, the pigeon horntail. The horntail has, is, a, is another, uh, um, hymenopteran, it's a more, more primitive group of hymenoptera. Its larvae are burrowers in tree trunks. They, they, uh, they, they lay their eggs and the dark larvae bore into um, pretty much dead and dying hardwoods uh, where they uh, live for um, their, their larval period. And then they metamorphose into these flying adults, the, the horn tails themselves. <clears throat> the wasp on the left-hand side, the ichneumonid, uh, preys solely on this pigeon horntail. There are three species of, of, uh, of giant ichneumonids that we have in our area that feed all, all feed on this one species of horntail, the um, Tremex um, columba. And they do so making use of that very long um, process coming out of the rear end of that female. That's, that's um, technically an, an ovipositor. They use it to actually lay their eggs they can't sting with it, not this group. Uh, the, the ovipositors is too thin and flexible and, and doesn't carry the same kind of, of poisons that uh, other wasps do. But they can actually use this to bore down through the wood and reach into the interiors of the tree trunks where the larvae of the um, pigeon horntail are, are living. And they can lay an egg uh, using these very long ovipositors on their victims, which then hatch out and, and consume the uh, the larva of the horntail. The three different species um, of giant ichneumonids differ in terms of the length of their ovipositors. This is actually the, the species that has the shortest um, ovipositor. There's one that has an ovipositor of over 10 inches, uh, about hmm, seven to eight inches, I think. Um, and each one is specialized for reaching horntail larvae at different depths in the tree trunks. So that's one way to uh, minimize competition by having these different length ovipositors and, and being able to, to prey on different uh, uh, individual uh, larvae of the horntail. Again, you know, a very specialized system. Just, just consider how long it would take to evolve that kind of capability. You not only have to have a, an ovipositor that can, can do that, can actually drill through the wood, but how do you find those larvae in the first place, the larvae that you're trying to parasitize? Um, you have to have all kinds of special sensory abilities. And then when you're sticking that long ovipositor down in the wood, how does it guide its way to, to find the larva? Just think about how many uh, thousands of years it would take to evolve that precise a system. Uh, just in, in, an incredible set of, of adaptations for, for um, being a very highly specialized predator. Uh, these, uh, the, the, the wasps that feed on wood boring insects are actually some of our most important biological controls. They keep the ecosystems, forested ecosystems, um, stable. Uh, it's a, a, um, a, something that we really need to give them a great deal of uh, appreciation for. But it's more often than not the case that we only realize how important they are in their absence. If you take uh, a, a, a beetle larva from China, and you transport it to North America where it has no natural predators, you get this. And I'm sure all of you have seen this by now, the, uh, the die-off of ash trees that's taking place across the state thanks to the introduced emerald ash borer. This is a beetle that, um, whose larvae live under the bark of the ash trees, and that's all ash species. And they make these, these characteristic girdling marks underneath. And uh, this is the adult beetle, and this is the emergence hole after it comes out 
uh, after it's pupated. But it, it, it lacks, um, all, you know, in, in a state of China, it's just a harmless beetle, you know, very benign. It's, it's, it's no more of a problem than, than, than any other uh, herbace, uh, uh, herb, herbivorous species. It's only when you take it out of its native habitat with its native control species that it becomes this, this huge menace that it is here in our forest in, in, this, in this very foreign environment that has been placed. Um, we have some of our insect, uh, some of our wasp species have been found to, to prey on the emerald ash borer, but none are, are very specialized. They just haven't had the long history of adaptations necessary to, to specialize on this particular species. So the USDA has taken the trouble to go to China, uh, East Asia, and find some of those native species that, that specialize particularly on the emerald ash borer. And they're currently trying to breed them in captivity so they can, can do mass releases in hopes of stopping the, the ash borer um, as quickly as possible. Uh, they're doing some of these releases here in North Carolina. Um, but it, it'll be um, a real race to see if these will have any effect before the last ash tree disappears from our um, ecosystems. Okay, so one other major role that insects play that I need to talk about is uh, detritivory. That's insects uh, as feeding on uh, dead, dead organisms and, and recycling their nutrients. We now have a lot of dead ash tree logs on the ground um, in, in a lot of our bottomland forests in particular. They're just, uh, I don't wanna walk out in some of the bottomland forests during any sort of windy event because the, ash, ash, the dead ashes are just crashing down, um, but that, that opens the, the question, where, what happens to those dead logs once they're on the ground? Well, fungus and other um, microorganisms um, are, are, play a big role, but so do insects. They play a, a very big role in opening up these dead logs for other uh, organisms to invade. They're very important in, in breaking down the, the wood uh, to begin with. The larva that's shown here, a lot of beetles are very specialized uh, for, for eating uh, dead wood and live inside dead logs. This is uh, the larva of the giant stag beetle, one of our most spectacular uh, beetles. Um, but a lot of the, the scarabs, the, um, um, the, the lucanids, the stag beetles, and a number of other families are, are highly specialized for feeding on dead wood. Other uh, important uh, detritivores are the carrion beetles. This is the American carrion beetle. When, when any animal dies anywhere, um, on dry land at least, some of the very first uh, organisms that reach it in order to recycle its, uh, its matter are, are these carrion beetles and the green bottle fly that I showed earlier is another very early arrival on, on dead bodies. It just takes a matter of, of, of minutes or days for these insects to show up and they, they start consuming the dead material and recycling it, making it available for other species to use, plants included, um, they, they play this very important role of, of, um, of taking these dead organisms and, and putting their nutrients back in a form that can be used by the, the ecosystem. Without them, we would have no ecosystems. We have to have the, these detritivores and insects certainly play a, a very key role in that, in that process. Same is true for, for, for um, Waste products, this is a, these are dung beetles that are rolling up a ball of, uh, of probably cow dung. I can't remember exactly where I took this picture. It was done maybe 30 years ago, but I suspect it was in a pasture somewhere around here in Chapel Hill. Uh, they, they do a great job in recycling uh, cow patties, these, these uh, particular dung, tumble bugs. And a lot of, uh, you know, as, as soon as uh, dung drops the ground, you're gonna have insects reach it in a very short order uh, competing very quickly to, to make use of the, uh, the nutrients that are uh, contained within it. So again, we, we would have a, a very different world if we didn't have insects doing this sort of recycling. Um, as with the, the very specialized uh, predation and herbivorous uh, or, uh, examples of predators, predator-prey relationships and herbivore plant relationships, we have the same sort of specializations among the detritivores. 
This is a flesh fly. It belongs to the family Sarcophagidae. Sarcophagidae. And this group of flies uh, specializes on, on preying on, on dead uh, organisms, dead animals primarily. And one genus in this family uh, feed only are associated solely with pitcher plants, going back to our, our pitcher plant um, paradigm. Um, the larvae of this, the, the maggots of this fly, of these flies, are specialized to feed on the dead insects that the pitcher plant is capturing uh, down in the bottoms of its uh, funnels. The maggots live down in those aquatic pools. They can certainly cope with the, uh, the enzymes produced by the pitcher plants. Uh, but they, 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 help, um, they help digest all that material. The plants themselves have no stomachs. They can't churn up the dead material. They, can't, they have a hard time um, breaking it down. Um, but the insects certainly help um, break down the material, making the nutrients much more available to the plants than they, than they would uh, be otherwise. So they're actually very um, useful for the plant and have developed these very strong mutualistic relationships with, with their, their host plants. The only place you can find these flies is, is uh, around pitcher plants. Should point out that these, these flies are also very important pollinators. Uh, they con the, the adults of the flies congregate in the flowers of the pitcher plants. And uh, they may not be as important as bumblebees in, in actually the massive pollen they're able to transport but they have one very important feature going for them as pollinators. They can move long distances between pitcher plant populations. Bumblebees are limited to a, you know, a radius around their, co their colony. They can't go but so far um, uh, away from their colony. So they, they aren't able to really do long distance transport of pollen. These flies on the other hand, uh, it's in their interest to fly far and wide between populations. And so in terms of cross uh, population transfer of pollen, these guys are, are doing a much more efficient job than, than even the bees are. The reason the, plant, the, the flies have to fly long distances um, is, is this factor. Pitcher plants uh, are highly adapted to fire. They need fire to keep their habitats open and sunny. Otherwise they starve as in the picture I showed earlier. The pitcher plants do very good at, well, that's, that's a picture of a, a very sad pitcher plant patch that has been uh, shaded out, similar to the one I showed before. If you don't have fire, this is the result. You sooner or later do not have pitcher plants. After a burn, the pitcher plants are able to pop up from their uh, rhizomes, uh, underground uh, structures that, that don't get consumed in the fire. This shows a, uh, a, a pitcher plants emerging after about a week following a fire down in, in the, uh, the Croatan National Forest. A lot of other plant species do the same thing. You have toothache grass that's also popping right back up after the fire. Insects that are associated with pitcher plants do not pop back up. They have nothing underground that gives them any protection. Um, <clears throat> And uh, when a fire sweeps through uh, pitcher plant habitats, the insects are all consumed. They're just, they're sitting ducks for any fire. So how do you have any insects that show this, this extreme specialization on a, a plant that itself is highly so highly dependent on fire? The answer is in the extreme mobility of the insects. They, they can fly and they can, if in a big fire, there are always some patches uh, of habitats that are left unburned. And those are the refugia from which um, the insects can quickly move out from and recolonize all the areas that are burned. They really require the survival of at least some patches of habitat in any given fire. But because they are so mobile and they're able to build up their population so fast, this system works very well for them. They can, they can persist within a very fire rich habitat like our coastal plain used to be um, without being able in fact to, to survive through a fire itself the way the plants do. Okay, uh, that in itself makes the insects very vulnerable to habitat fragmentation. When the habitats become too small and too far apart because of fire suppression or habitat conversion, 
um, the insects that are associated with these habitats are among the first to disappear. This is a, a habitat um, that has, uh, it had a population of, of a very vigorous population of pitcher plant moths that I had started visiting back in the early 90s. Um, but in, in one fire, uh, the fire swept through the whole area, left no un, unburned patches, and the insects now appear to be totally missing from, from this site. And as I mentioned in the, in the Awaris, uh, most of the populations of pitcher plants that have persisted, um, that, that, that was the case. Uh, a lot of them still were pretty green in terms of the plants themselves, but they're becoming so isolated uh, that without particular management, uh, intensive management that they themselves are going to disappear, um, you know, um, even though well after their insects have, have vanished from the scene. In the original coastal plain, uh, pitcher plants occupied, you know, very vast expanses of, of, of the landscape. This is a uh, shot I took at Fort Bragg in one of the uh, artillery impact areas. They have a lot of fire in those impact areas, as you might imagine. And the, uh, the populations of the plants are, are enormous, uh, covering tens of square miles. Uh, not any one patch, but the, the habitat patches themselves as an aggregate uh, cover you know, vast expanses of, of the landscape at Fort Bragg, particularly in the artillery impact areas. And um, even though it's not so obvious that there's, there's some plants that look a little bit more damaged than others. There, there definitely are, the moths are present in this, this habitat, even though the fire is pretty frequent. And the only reason that the moths are able to exist in these habitats is because of there's, there's just so much of the habitat and so many uh, connections between the habitats that they're able to use this mobility colonization, recolonization strategy to, to survive. Um, but that in fact is, is the key, one of the key things that make all insects successful the ability to, to rapidly move around the landscape, reestablish populations once they're lost, um, even though they have no special adaptations for, for surviving through disturbance events themselves. Um, not all insects have been so lucky. There, there are definitely, you might think that insects are, are just so super adapted to living on uh, in all terrestrial habitats that they'd be completely immune to uh, extinction, but that's definitely not the case. Um, this is one, one species that I was involved in surveying back in the 90s. And um, it's a species of uh, skipper, the ergo skipper, that, that, whose larvae in North Carolina are highly associated with one species of grass, the pine barrens reed grass. A species of grass that only uh, exists in fire maintained habitats, like the pitcher plants. In fact, you usually find them where, where we find pitcher plants, you find the uh, the pine barrens reed grass, very common in the artillery impact areas at Fort Bragg. This butterfly, though, um, is much more vulnerable to fire than, than just about any other insect I've, I've run across that lives in these habitats. By the time we started surveying for it in uh, the mid 1990s, we only knew of one population left in the entire coastal plain of North Carolina. Um, and uh, just one savanna where there was just a lot of the, uh, the host plant present and a lot of different patches of it so that, that uh, in any one fire, there would be probably some left alone. But in 2009, um, a very massive wildfire swept through this, this one last colony. Uh, swept, the, the natural fire swept up from the south, but the Forest Service set a backfire from the north. And guess where the two burns converged? right in the very center of the, the population of this, this butterfly. And we have not seen it in the state since. It, a lot of people have been out looking for it. Um, there have been some paid surveys by the Forest Service to try to document its survival somewhere, but it really appears to be gone. And um, that was the last population known between New Jersey and Florida. So it wasn't just North Carolina that, where the populations were lost, but. Uh, that whole vast area in between. Um, and even in Florida, there are populations that we witnessed during this uh, status survey for the species that disappeared because of, uh, uh, of fire, of, of fi because the habitats have been so reduced and so fragmented, they, they became uh, extremely vulnerable to, to uh, extirpation. 
There was another um, insect that we found in the savannas of uh, North Carolina. Uh, this a, a prairie, prairie, well, the Ergo skipper is primarily a prairie species. There are more species, more individual populations out in the, the tall grass prairies. So it didn't become extinct as a species. Um, but one other prairie species, we found the first and only population that's ever been found east of the Appalachians in one of our coastal plain savannas. And that now has also apparently succumbed to the same sort of causes, uh, habitat fragmentation and changes in the fire regime uh, that just made it too vulnerable to, to, uh, to burns. And it's gone, we think, from the state. And since there are only six known populations anywhere else on earth, um, the loss of that one population was, was pretty significant. One other species that I've been paying very close attention to for the past 30 years is the Venus flytrap cutworm. This is a moth uh, whose larvae are highly um, associated with, with Venus flytraps. Again, another um, insect catching plant uh, that has its own species of insects that are specialized to feed on it. The larvae just bore right through the, the traps and emerged the other, on the other side without, without paying any attention to um, the traps insect catching abilities at all. They're, they're just not, um, they, they, because they can bore right through the leaves, they, they, they're, they're not, um, they cannot be preyed upon by the plants. Um, but because Venus flytraps have become very rare, uh, the, the moths have consequently also become very rare. And the, the moths, um, because of their vulnerability to fire, have become even rarer than the uh, flytraps themselves. We now know of only four populations uh, in the state where this, uh, where this species uh, still exists. And we witnessed at least two populations uh, become extirpated during our, our surveys we've conducted for this species. So in this case, one of our most endemic insects um, is in danger because of, uh, of changes in, in the overall landscape. And it's a predator species, so you'd have to, at one point, this would be called a, a pest species by at least some people. But um, to me, it's, it's one of the uh, most amazingly adapted species we have and one of the most highly vulnerable species. I should say that, that I've done a lot of the work on this species with uh, Bo Sullivan. He's the one that took the picture of this uh, species. We did a rearing study to, to really document um, how the, the larvae were able to use the plant. And uh, Bo did most of that work. Okay, so it's one thing to, to, uh, to see how insects and, and plants associated with fire-maintained habitats might be in trouble because of all the things we've done to fire, uh, suppressing fire in the coastal plain. But would you ever think that species would become uh, vulnerable in the middle of uh, the eastern deciduous forests that dominate our landscape, that are still common and um, they just don't seem to have the same sort of factors of affecting them that, that are pretty easily seen down in, in the uh, coastal plain savannas. But nonetheless, we have a big extinction event that's going on right now. The emerald ash borer is not only taking out ash trees, but there are some hundred species of insects that feed primarily on ash or, or um, fringe tree related, uh, it's in the same family as the ashes. And a lot of them are now becoming extremely endangered because of the depredations of the ash borer. Some of them are a little bit more generalized and may survive uh, feeding on other species, but um, a, a lot of the species are, are, are so closely as, as associated with ash that they have very little chances of, of surviving. This is one of them, the ash sphinx. It's one of our uh, really big moths, a very handsome moth. I'd like to give um, credit to Jim Petranka again for taking this photo up, up in the mountains. We have him here in the, in the, the Piedmont, but uh, his photograph is one of the best I've, I've seen of this species. Uh, surprisingly, two of our biggest beetles are in danger because of uh, um, the emerald ash borer. Um, and this is somewhat surprising because the larvae of these beetles feed on dead wood. They're, they're quite happy to be feeding on dead logs of any sort, it doesn't have to be ash, can be any, any dead hardwood. But the adults of both these species have the peculiarity that they feed on the sap produced by ash twigs. The male beetles in particular um, chew the tips of ash twigs and causing the sap to flow, the sacks of the sap that they feed on 
but this, the sap is what attracts the females to the males. The females will come up uh, to take advantage of the sap and that's where all the mating takes place. So in both these uh, two species. Um, and again, it's, it's thought that the, the demise of ashes, they aren't known to, to do this with any other species of tree, that if, if ashes die out, so will these, these beetles. And these are two of our most spectacular insects that we have in the state, at least in terms of size and weight. These are, our, you know, our, some of our biggest insects. An even, even weirder association um, is also threatened by, by the same uh, factors. Uh, this shows um, a little colony of aphids uh, that, that are so highly associated with ash. This is the leaf curl aphid. The adults feed on um, both leaves of uh, ash trees, and in the winter they move underground and feed on the roots of ash, ash trees. And in the underground phase, they, they develop a symbiosis with a particular species of mushroom, a bolete, Boloitinellus, um, um, can't remember the species name. Anyway, the mushroom um, encloses the colonies with a, a, a sporangium. This is all fungal tissue that serves to protect the, the aphids from pr predators. Um, it's very much like what um, certain ant species do to protect uh, aphids and, and use them as, as cattle. Um, but in this case, it's a fungus doing, doing that. And so the fungus uh, in return for protecting these, these uh, aphids is able to get most of its nutrients from the honeydew that the aphids secrete. Uh, all aphids secrete uh, copious quantities of honeydew, which contain a, a large amount of um, sugars, undigested sugars um, in their fluids. And uh, it's been shown that the, most of the um, nutrition, nu nutrients that the fungus uses come from these aphids. And both the aphids and the plant and, and the aphids and the fungi are associated with ash trees. So as goes the ash species, so goes the, this, this very complicated symbiotic relationship. Should point out that this uh, association was discovered by Mark Brunetret, a mycologist, and this is a uh, picture that he, he uh, has uh, um, showing this very bizarre, but very highly uh, specialized adaptations that these species show. Um, the fungus has already been declared um, on the red list uh, for, by the IUCN. And uh, we're hoping that the, uh, the, the aphids uh, will also be given some sort of recognition as species in serious trouble, um, at least in, in North America. All right, enough of the, the grim stuff. Um, I'd like to sort of wrap up by talking a little bit about um, gardening and what people can do to sort of enhance the environment. Um, I'm not gonna say a whole lot because I've noticed that you have already had a number of um, people talking about pollinator, pollination gardens, landscape gardens, and so on. But I, I wanna add my endorsement for this, this, the development of these, um, these, these kinds of gardens. Uh, this shot is a, a picture of um, a butterfly garden that my wife actually planted uh, back in the 80s. Um, we lived out at that time uh, on, a, on a dairy farm, and um, this was the only bit of natural vegetation for, uh, I want to say, 100, 100, well, hundreds of yards around. This dairy it was just totally, um, the vegetation was, as you can imagine, in dairy, just decimated by, by decades and ge or generations of cattle grazing. And so this is one little bright spot in the middle of, that, uh, of those pastures. <clears throat> but by planting this, um, these plants that are attracted, butterfly weed in this case, that are attracted to insects, we, we got a lot of flowers coming up from quite a distance. It would ha have had to been quite a distance to reach that little patch from uh, surrounding more natural habitats. So they're definitely very effective. You put out a, a um, butterfly bush, a butterfly weed, um, or other native plants, uh, you will get uh, a, a nice array of, of uh, insects coming to, to find them. Here's a leaf cutter bee, um, uh, again, coming to uh, the butterfly weed uh, in, that, in that garden. Um, 
So a lot of people, and I imagine a lot of you in this uh, this group are are planting plants specifically to uh, attract pollinators, and uh, that that has a, a very beneficial effect on not only uh, you know for your own garden and making sure your your plants are, are being properly pollinated so they can set good seeds and keep on going, uh, but it also in, it enhances the surrounding environment as well. Um, I mentioned before that, that uh, pollen, uh, some of the pollinators are, are um, also carrying on uh, sort of this mercenary function of eating other um, herbivorous insects. This is a, a great one to, to attract to your garden. If you have any native plants, I'm sure you will see this species. If you want a species that attacks um, Japanese beetles, this is the one for you. Its larvae are um, highly um, adapted to, to feeding on beetle grubs. Japanese beetles are one of its favorite play, prey items. So are the green, the big green June bugs that, that uh, uh, are common in, in grassland habitats in North Carolina. Uh, two more species of um, um, uh, biological control species that are attracted to nectar that may or may not be important as pollinators. They don't have the hairs that, that allow them to efficiently transport pollen, but the feather-legged fly is, is a, a specialist on um, true bugs, uh, stink bugs, plant bugs, um, seed bugs, a number of um, uh, important herbivorous species. And the one on the right, I'm, I'm sure Nancy probably should cover her eyes for this one, it's a predator on um, Hymenoptera, including bumblebees. And it, it's called the thick-headed fly, but it could also be called the can opener fly. The, the abdomen is, is modified to actually pry open the plates on the backs of bees and other Hymenoptera so it can insert its uh, eggs. Can opener fly would be a good uh, common name. So would grave digger fly. In, in bumblebees in particular, the, the larvae that's parasitizing them actually changes the behavior of the bee, causing it to go down to the ground and dig its own grave. And that's where the, uh, the fly larvae pupate inside the pupae, uh, sorry, inside their victim, but well buried underground. Okay, and uh, a lot of people are now providing um, host plants specifically to attract herbivores. This is the, the black swallowtail, which if you've ever planted a, any sort of umbel, in your, your garden, you were bound to have seen. This is the adult. And um, this is a new, you know, fairly new development. The idea is, is to actually bring in some of these uh, herbivore species and, and benefit them specifically by planting their host plants. And this is what, um, this is an encouraging development in the idea that, that insects, at least some insects are definitely worthy of um, sharing food with or sharing the garden with or making some sacrifice, in other words, giving them some, some positive value that they might other, otherwise not have. And it's this sort of um, generosity, if you want to put it that way, that uh, offers us some hope that we can still work together to save the planet. Um, Doug Tallamy and others have taken this even further, um, recommending that we plant uh, all kinds of plants specifically to, to support ecosystems, um, support birds, lizards, insects, uh, in addition to the plants, just um, planting in order to, to save the ecosystems. Um, and I hope this is, is something that you're all um, contemplating. Um, I do most, a lot of my phot photography at the North Carolina Botanical Gardens. And um, this is a great place to see all of these things working in, in action. A lot of the pollinators I've photographed are, are here, uh, were taken in the growing beds, uh, the display gardens at, at, the, uh, at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Um, they have two things going for them, um, insects do at the garden. Uh, the first is that the garden does not use pesticides at all to control her herbivory on their, their plants. Instead, they are relying almost completely on uh, natural biologic controls to do that job for them. All those um, predatory wasps and flies and so on that I've, I've shown in these, these uh, slides, they're 
very easy to, to spot at the garden. I, 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 have, I teach a class there in the summer. And one of the things I, that, that we do is take a tour through the gardens and, and look at these, these, uh, these, these natural biological controls uh, close up and uh, nobody's been stung so far, um, but the, the, uh, they're doing a great job of keeping the, uh, predator, the herbivorous insects down to manageable levels such that we can have, that they have uh, very beautiful displays of, of uh, flowers uh, throughout the, uh, the growing season. They also have the advantage in, in being uh, very closely uh, adjoined to uh, a very uh, large natural ecosystem. The, uh, the trail system outside the fenced area of the garden, they have fences to keep out the deer, but outside the fences, they have a, a trail system through a very beautiful stand of deciduous forest. And this forest has connections all the, that, that extend for miles all the way down to Jordan Lake. And because of that intact ecosystem, uh, a lot of the biological controls that we see, the insects that were, are involved in those control efforts that we see in the garden um, proper are coming from those, those ecosystems and, and are returning to it. And the, the two, both the garden and the natural ecosystem are symbiotic in, in the sense that they sort of share uh, some of these, these benefits, the control organisms. So in, in planting your gardens and in, um, uh, encouraging insects in particular, uh, you're, you're benefiting not only your own garden, but in, uh, you're also helping uh, the much wider world in which both, in which we all live. Um, we haven't uh, totally become so mechanized that we can, can live without natural ecosystems. We still need natural ecosystems for um, the air we breathe, to purify our water, um, to recycle our nutrients, um, they're still doing an awful lot of ecosystem services that we critically depend upon. Um, we may think we can totally modify the earth to suit our own needs, but that's, that's not true yet. We cannot do that yet. And it will be a very sad day when we finally figure out how to become totally machines and live in a totally um, human modified world. I'd much rather um, stay human and enjoy insects and plants in, in native ecosystems. So anything we can do to, um, to enhance the survival of those systems, the better it is for humanity, in my opinion. Um, and, but one thing we need to do is give more appreciation to biological interactions, not just individual species that we happen to like, um, but to all the different processes that are involved that involve many different species of organisms, many different kinds of organisms, and realize that all of them are necessary, including insects, for those, those ecosystems to persist. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. Well, thank you so much, Steve. That was really, really beautiful and uh, the one disadvantage to Zoom is that you couldn't hear all of us ooing and eyeing as you went through your slides. Um, so I hope everyone will um, unmute and um, go ahead and turn your um, videos back on. And that's the one advantage we have for our kind of small meetings. We've made them meetings rather than presentations so everyone can um, participate at the end and um, have a little bit of a talk. Um, together. So does anyone have any questions? Please um, unmute. I'll, I'll check the chat as well, but please feel free to just unmute and, um, and, and uh, ask yeah. directly. I forgot this slide. Oh, yes. And um, so Steve didn't talk too much about the NC Biodiversity Project, um, but um, it's full of many of the pictures, I think, that he showed tonight. And um, there, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Steve? Well, yeah, I, I thought I just would, would mention that, that um, um, I've been working for the past uh, almost 10 years now on the Bio North Carolina Biodiversity Project. This is a series of websites covering uh, lots of different taxonomic groups. Uh, where we try to provide fairly detailed information on the distribution of species in our state, 
and some of their conservation needs, uh, some of their life histories, uh, information on their life histories. But we are definitely a very multi-taxonomic, um, very diverse taxonomically. We have a one, one big um, websites for native plant species. We have one uh, fairly new one for, for the, the native bees of North Carolina. I've been working on the moths and butterfly, well, moths of North Carolina for a long time. Harry Legrand has, has a butterfly website. So we have a lot of different taxonomic groups uh, represented. Um, we have one central um, website uh, whose URL is shown here on the screen. So if you're, if you're interested in seeing some of these um, other, and we, we welcome, in, in a lot of cases, we welcome um, submissions of records and photographs from the public. And uh, yeah. a lot of the records we have for the moths, for instance, have come from um, people just observing uh, moths in their backyards. It's given us a huge amount of information and um, that's true for, for many of our websites. And uh, so we, we really want to encourage the, the public to find these websites and to, uh, to take part in them and, and to hopefully learn something about the, uh, the native species we have in North Carolina from these, these websites. So if you do decide to upload there, you, it'll ask you for a lot of details about the insects or plants that you um, have photographed, um, like latitude and longitude and numbers and things like that. So keep that in mind, but you can also post to um, iNaturalist and that data can still be used by the biodiversity project um, it, once it's verified. And um, we do have one question um, from someone who doesn't have um, audio. Um, Kim um, wanted to say, well, ask, um, how often do new species of insects evolve in response to our changing environment? <laughs> well, it depends on what you call a new species. We have uh, insects that are adapting to changes in, in, ha in their habitats um, on a continuous basis. It, it, it does take a fairly long time to become as highly adapted to your environment as, as the pitcher plant moths are. But uh, the, um, the experience with uh, the pesticide spraying has shown that, that some insects can very rapidly adapt to, to uh, pesticides uh, within just a, a few generations. So, um, in, but those are, they, they're not becoming new species. They're, they're just uh, becoming more adapted to um, a fairly narrow range of, of habitat changes. It takes um, it, it takes a much longer time period to actually evolve new species. Um, and sometimes it has to do with isolation. Um, yes, uh, normally it, it has to involve isolation. You take one population and isolate it, and if it's if it survives, once you've isolated the population, it becomes more and more precarious. But if it's given a chance to survive, it will adapt um, more and more closely to. Um, it's a very narrow set of uh, local habitat um, conditions. And but eventually will become so different that it becomes a different species. I'm gonna jump in, sorry. In terms of evolution, that can actually happen a lot quicker than we, we really thought. There was the book, um, The Beak of the Finch. Has anyone read that? Um, that looked at how just within a couple seasons, um, the, the finch beaks would evolve based on food availability. So I'm yeah, sure you're talking about the Galapagos, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, I had a couple of questions. Does, does anybody else have any? You, there's a bunch of thank yous and what a fantastic presentation. Um, I was wondering, I was going to suggest that if people see pictures of the pitcher plant moth caterpillar, to be sure to share those photos with Steve and also with the Biodiversity Project. Um, I was wondering how you can tell a grass mantis from a walking stick. Are they the same or are they, it's a- no, they're, they're very, very different. Um, uh, walking sticks are herbivorous species um, and they do not capture insects. Okay. And all mantises have those grasping forelegs yeah. that, that the walking sticks just do not have. They That's otherwise cool. look very similar, but one eats insects and one eats plants and they, they're adapted for very different uh, lifestyles. And I also wondered, you know, you see bumblebees on the pitcher plants. Um, oftentimes it looks like they might be collecting something from the outside of the leaves. Do you know what they're doing? Um, I, no, actually, I, I can't probably answer that uh, directly, but 
the pitcher plants do pro um, produce a secretion that's intended to attract insects. It's one of their adaptations for catching insects. Um, but the bumblebees um, are very important pollinators. So I'm sure, I'm pretty sure the, <laughs> it's not in the best interests of the plants to, to, uh, to, to catch too many bumblebees anyway. They, they want them for other purposes. I mean, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. Sorry, I didn't mean to say bumblebees. It, it seems mainly, it's probably bumblebees too, but mainly carpenter bees. I see a lot of um, um, mud daubers on the outsides of pitcher plants, um, but at least some, and I don't know if they're, they're just being attracted to the uh, secretions that the plants are putting out to attract insects. At least some of them actually build their nests inside the pitchers. And um, I'm, I'm really not sure uh, all the details of that particular relationship. It's not an obligate uh, relationship the way it is with the, with the moths. The moths have to live in those plants. They can't live anywhere else. But the mud daubers, uh, the, you see around pitcher plants definitely can, can uh, survive without them.